He took our sin, he took our, our shame upon himself and won that battle. All battles can be won by our God. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, it's a great pleasure to have all you guys here today. If it's your very first time, you'll see a small packet uh, on your seats there on the row. There'll be a couple things in there. The first is that blue card, which is our Connect card. So if you are interested in learning more about us, about Napa Valley Life Church, we'd love to hear from you if you could fill that out. And if you turn that into our Connect desk, there will be a gift for you, a coffee cup. It's very slick. It's very cool. Um, so check that out. Please fill that out and uh, connect with the connect folks at the Connect desk. There is a prayer card there as well. Um, we believe in the power of prayer. We believe that God answers prayers. And so if you want to fill that out, we'd love to be praying for you. Uh, additionally, there's an envelope in there. Um, if you'd like to give, you can insert your tithes and offering into that envelope and drop it on one of these boxes on the back wall. Uh, additionally, you can give online at nvlife.org slash give. We are really excited about Easter. Amen? Amen. So this is a time when people who might not come to church are willing to come to church. And so let's be inviting folks and go ahead and sign up online. We're going to have two services. So if you could register online, that would be great. Uh, go to the website uh, to be able to do that. Additionally, we have our Seize Candy Drive that the youth is doing. So we're really excited about the youth and camp and getting back to camp as things are opening up. Uh, the youth will be selling Seize Candy. You can go online to help them out, but they also have a table set up. So if you have some difficulty with getting online or anything with that, they can, uh, they can order that for you. It will be delivered straight to you. Don't have to worry about, you know, waiting for someone to drop things off or anything like that. Uh, the last thing is, something that's interesting, exciting, and new, is we're actually going to be live streaming this service. We had some issues with our recording uh, this morning, so we're going to be live streaming, so don't say anything embarrassing, you know, don't do anything crazy today, <laughs> this is not the day, but we are going to be doing that, so you'll be able to see that online uh, as well as for our folks at home, just so you know. Uh, let's pray, and then we'll get back into worship. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that... We can be weak because you are our strength. Lord, that the battle is not won by us. Our salvation is, does not rest on us to climb a hill to win the battle. But Lord, the battle is won because you came down and you won the battle. And so we can draw near to you because of that. Not working hard or doing anything that that might ingratiate us to you, but Lord, you have done the work and you call us to draw near to you. So Lord, we draw near to you now, Lord, in worship. Lord, we pray that you would be glorified in our worship, Lord, and that you would be glorified in the word that is preached, Lord, that our hearts and our minds would be illuminated to your word, and that your spirit would be with us, Lord, because whether we sing or we preach, we preach and sing to an audience of one, which is you, for your glory. In your name I pray.
type of life. Everybody guides in some type of direction. So where do we, what is our point? What is the thing that we are pulling people to? And it's simple. It's love. We are driven by love. And that love is not just the squishy feeling inside when we watch those movies that we love. It's not the feeling that we got the first time we met our spouse and we were madly instantly in love like I was, of course, and Andrea too, obviously. But instead, it is a deeper love, a sacrificial love, a love that is only demonstrated through our God stepping down from heaven to die for a people that sinned against him. That's the light that we are, to show that love to the world, Christ's sacrificial love to a desperate world in need. So today we're talking about that. As we look at the Ten Commandments, as we continue, the big idea, walk home with this, write it down if you want to, I'm sure it's on your bulletin. We are driven by love. This is our question and answer series, we've been looking at this for about 11 weeks now, and what we're committed to doing is asking difficult questions and finding difficult answers. And so we have these questions and we have these answers. But our goal in this is not just to sensationalize questions. Today we're going to be in difficult stuff if you're church. There's no other way to put it. It's not to sensationalize these questions. It's not to look at these and, and sit back and just ponder the world. Instead, it's for us to grow doctrinally. Meaning that we are so absolutely dedicated to our growth in knowing who God is and what he requires from us. Because if you get lazy with this, if you do not seek God more, learn about him doctrine, this is what happens. 2 Timothy 4.3. Paul writing to Timothy, a young pastor, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But at itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Church, us, every church, is not immune to this. If we do not put the foundation of good doctrine and Bible and God's word into our lives, we will wander into myths. And so together, we are going to seek him. We're going to pursue him. We're going to know him more. And for the last few weeks, we've been looking at the Ten Commandments. So we're going to continue that today. And we're looking at it in the book of Romans. Let me read it for you here. Um, it says this in Romans 13, 8. Do not owe anyone anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and any other commandment are summed up by this commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of law. Let's pray. Lord, we are thankful. So we're looking at these, we're, we actually have four commandments in this Roman passage, but we're only going to look at three, because we'll get to coveting later. You get a double dose of coveting here. And so we're looking at this in the light of Romans. Now Romans is a New Testament book, this is not where these ten commandments were given, but instead it's Paul rehashing these commandments here. What we need to know about Romans is one, that it's one of the most theologically rich books in all of the epistles. There was a church established, Paul was a church planner, he would just go around establishing churches and putting elders into place. And so he's doing this, and a church pops up in Rome, one that he did not plant. And he hears about these excited Christians in Rome. And he says, I need to write to them to make sure that they have good doctrine, that they're not wandering into myths, that they're not making up their beliefs. So he writes the book of Romans to them. He's writing to them to say, hey, this is what you need to believe. And it's all about justification by faith alone, through God's grace alone. That is what he's filling with this. And this book is incredibly rich. You have guys like Augustine who got saved by reading Romans. You have Luther who changed all of his beliefs because he read through Romans. Church, get used to Romans. It's a wonderful book. And so what you see is the first 12 chapters of Romans is this theological framework that Paul establishes. Then the last chapter is really 12, the end of 12 to 16, is how to practically live it out. He's saying, now you've got the head knowledge, this is how you live it out. 
And so when we get to chapter 13, verses 8 through 10, we are, he's telling the church in Rome, this is how you live out everything I've just established in these first 12 chapters. So he says again, owe no one anything, or excuse me, do not owe anyone anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and other commandment are summed up by this commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does a wrong to a neighbor, love therefore is the fulfillment of, our, of the law. We are defined by our love, not by rules. We are saved by his love. Again, not by rules that we kept up, but because we broke them so badly that he had to come and die for us. This is his love. But the problem is, as we look at love and that we're this light shining to this world, this love message of who Jesus Christ is, the gospel, we approach a world that is dedicated to darkness, that loves darkness. And oftentimes we'll look at them and be like, how can they be so dark? Well, let me tell us this, tell you this, me and you, if you're a follower of Jesus, have been in that darkness before. Before you were saved, you lived in the same darkness that the rest of the world is in. And this is what it looks like. John 3, 16, you guys know this one. For God so loved the world, that's a really good spot to start, that he gave the Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order the world might be saved through him. Verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be expressed, or exposed. Excuse me. But whoever does what is true comes to light, so it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Do you see what he's saying here? There's a juxtapose. We are the light, right? Jesus' light shining through us through our love. But we're coming against a world that is dark. And there are hard truths that come with this. When we talk about love, when we talk about life, we have to understand that there are hard truths here. A hard truth like this, that we sin against God, that's a hard truth. Deserving of hell, that's a hard truth. We deserve death, that's a hard truth. And there's people that are coming against God still, enemies of God still, do not know Christ. And that's a hard truth. But Jesus, God, stepped out of heaven, became a man, died on a cross, and defeated death. The death that we deserve. Church, wake up daily and tell yourself that. Because he took that for you. And if you call on his name, believe that he is God, you are saved. Judgment has been fulfilled. And by this, God looks at us and says that we are guilty, but the death sentence has been received by Christ. Amen. Isn't that great? Church, this is our message. Yeah, you thought that. And now we love the light in a world that is madly in love with darkness. For Christians, we're driven by love. We recognize hard truths. We seek to be more like Him. And today we're going to be talking about hot button issues. Issues that uh, we don't love to talk about. Maybe if you're in polite company, you don't like to talk about these. I don't know if there is polite company anymore. Amen. <laughs> You're here for the first time, understand that these are very difficult issues that we'll be talking to. If you're here and been a member for a number of years, understand this is a difficult topic. But we are framing this out in love. Meaning this, that no matter how we look at these very much issues we are dealing with today, we have to frame it in love. And we are going to be honest. We're going to look at scripture. We are going to see what he desires of us and mend to him. Because if we don't, we will wander into mist. But it also means that we have to recognize hard truths. And so, to do that properly, we need to be driven by love. So let's look at these hard truths through the three commandments today. We are driven by love. Our main point again, the first thing that we see is love that does not harm. We're driven by love, love that does not harm. Verse 9. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, word, excuse me, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. We're jumping out a little bit out of order today. We're going to get back to birthday, I promise. It's good. We can't skip it. But we're going to start with the Ten Commandments, or the three commandments we're looking at. And again, I know there are four here. We're going to skip over coveting because we'll be there in a couple uh, weeks. Let me introduce you to an animal. This is the platypus. That, that's the cutest animal that's ever lived, is it not? The platypus is incredible because the platypus is classified as a mammal, but it does things like lay eggs. Mammals aren't supposed to lay eggs. You remember anything from like fifth grade science? Mammals aren't supposed to lay eggs. Matter of fact, the person that first wrote about the platypus was an 18th century zoologist named George Shaw. He wrote this article and sent it back to be peer reviewed, and his peers, other zoologists, said, You're making this up. It can't be real. This animal cannot be real. It's a weird animal in a gray area. It doesn't really make sense. It doesn't really have a true classification. So oftentimes when we look at the commands of God, we think, man, this has to be a gray area, right? There should be some gray here. But in reality, the commandments that we're looking at are more like this. This is a bull. That's a bull. The other one's platypus. That's a mammal. We all know that's a mammal, right? It's black and white. It does everything a mammal is supposed to do. These commandments are short. These commandments are clear. They are the shortest commandments we see in the Ten Commandments, and they are uh, severe. When they're committed, when you commit these, or when you uh, go against these commandments, they are the antithesis of love. Yet our broken human nature holds to them. We easily break them. You take the bull off the screen. It's distracting me now. I see it off the side here. <laughs> and so what does Romans say? It says this. If you love people, if you love, you will not harm them. You will not harm them. You will not commit adultery if you love people, if you love your bride. You will not murder if you love. You will not steal if you love. You will not covet if you love. It is as easy as it gets. If you break them, you are not being defined by love. If you keep them, you are showing that you love your neighbor. But let's dig in a little deeper as we get a little bit more uncomfortable. Amen? You guys ready to get uncomfortable? <laughs> Last chance for? Okay, we're going to go for it now. First one we're going to talk about. You shall not commit adultery. You ready? I'm, I'm ready. We're going to do it. Now, adultery is clearly alluding to marital infidelity. If you love your wife, you will not cheat on your wife. It's very clear. The Bible is very severe in this. Marriage is the most important relationship that we see amongst humans. It's the first one that's established between two humans, two created beings here. We see that it is such an important relationship that Jesus' most important relationship is the church, and he calls us his bride. And so we see that that is such a significant uh, point of why marriage is so important. And so we understand if you commit adultery, you are not loving your wife. But on, this can be generalized to all improper sexual relationships. This is, this is one of the burdens that we bear as human beings. That we are so drawn to sexual why? Well, when we define love, and you say, hey, our, we are defined by our love, so oftentimes, and if you say it to the world, they will define it as sex. They will say that love is equal to sex. Sexual sin is the most pervasive and difficult burden, one of the most pervasive and difficult burdens that we see in Scripture. In fact, when they list out sin in Scripture, most of the time they include some element of sexual sin. Let me give you an example here. Colossians 5, uh, 3, 5, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual morality, impurity, passion, evil, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And so we see it all the time in Scripture. Why is it so important? Because it is so difficult for us to keep up with. And even more than that, sex is more than a physical act. It is a spiritual act. Rebecca McLaughlin, who wrote Confronting Christianity, uh, it's a book that our staff is going through, and if you need it, we have a bunch of copies. We'd love for you to read it. It says this about sex. It says the Bible presents marriage 
as a one body experience, a man and woman knit together in a spiritual one flesh reality, illustrated by the fleshiness of sex and manifested by the combining of two parents' DNA in each child. It's significant, church. This is not something we throw away. Yet, if you look at the world and its presentation of sex, it is a throwaway act that doesn't really matter. It pushes it. It says it's okay. Why is marriage confined to, uh, why is sex confined to marriage? Because that is where it's best expressed, where innocent securities can be thrown aside because of the security of your union, where the love of knowing your spouse takes center stage and sex can become beautiful. Other than that, it can be soul bearing. When we betray or diminish sex, it destroys and consumes. The world, our depraved, our depraved world, takes something wonderful like all sin. It warps it. It makes it wrong. And it does it by very a bunch of different ways. But we understand that sexual hurt, sexual sin, is deep. It is. It is. It harms significantly. Yeah, we see it. It's not immune in the church. The world, eighty-four percent of people do, and we're not just talking about sex. We're also talking about a gamut of other sexual sin here. Eighty-four percent of people say they regularly use porn. That's the world. Fifty-four percent of Christians, identifying Christians, say there are. identifies us by sex. Are you having it or not? Who are you attracted to? Do you need to come out so that your identity can be known to everybody by gender, by attraction? We, church, we have made sex our idol. And this is not unique. We see this throughout scripture. We see this throughout history. That sex is a continual idol. Romans 1 Claiming to be, or verse 22, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. So what is he saying here is that they removed God and put created beings to worship. They started worshiping idols. What happens was the culmination of this. Verse 24, therefore God gave them up into lust to their heart of their hearts and impurity to the dishonoring of their bodies amongst themselves because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions for the women exchanged unnatural relations for those who were, that were contrary to nature. And men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. What happens? We take God off his throne, or we attempt to. We put our own idols up, and we start worshiping sex. And where does it lead? It leads to sin and destruction. And the walls keep coming down, and the depravity keeps getting worse. Adultery is not only allowed, it is glorified. And we see that today, church. Polyamorous movement where married couples are bringing in another person into their relationship. And church, this is not looked at like weird. This is looked at as fun and awesome and something that everybody should be a part of. Sexual sin is not only allowed, it is your number one priority. Church, sinners saved by grace, this is not how it should be. Your identity is not in your sexuality. It is an imago die, meaning you are created from God, an image bearer of God. Do not relinquish that identity for something so small like sex. Genesis 1, 26, and God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds 
right, of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Look at the world around you. When you've messed up the identity of a mob of God, everything else crumbles under it. When you take your identity and wrap it into something that is not being an image bearer of God, you're no longer an image of God. You are a sexual attraction. You are not an image of God. You are unsatisfied with your gender. You're not an image of God. You are a victim of society. Church, do not let this take away. Don't let the world take this away from you. You are an imago die. And when you make your identity anything else, you're devaluing it. That is not love. Maybe through that one. Let's go to the next one. What do you say? <laughs> Amens around? Oh, yeah. Amens around there. All right, let's go to the next slide one. You shall not murder. Oh, jeez. Are you serious? Let's go for it, right? We go from adultery to murder. These are short. They are powerful. And this is the commandment that I'm sure all of you are saying. I don't think I struggle with murder, right? It's been a long time since murder happened anywhere right near me. And the truth is that this is something that we struggle with. And we like to say that we're in modern society where this doesn't happen anymore, where the first sin that we see outside of Adam and Eve, really in scripture, is what? Is Cain and Abel. Cain murdered Abel. Murder is part of our DNA. It's part of something that happens. It's a reason it is a Ten Commandment. And we'll look that Jesus takes it further than that. But let's be honest here. Murder has come to something that on a massive scale that we have allowed we have allowed this to take over. We live in a, in a country where we've become desensitized to murder. In 2018, the CDC, this is not a Christian organization, this is the CDC, reported that 620,000 abortions happened inside the U.S. Nearly 200 abortions for every 1,000 births. Guys, that's one out of Virginia, New York, there's legislation that's going through to allow abortions all the way up through the act of childbirth. We call that infanticide. When questioned being the bill's sponsor and the scope of the proposal, they were asked if a woman was, uh, this lawmaker, I'm not going to give her name, was allowed, uh, was asked if uh, a woman who was dilating was allowed to get a, an abortion, meaning the baby's coming. She said, my bill would allow that. civilized in the world back then. We were no more afraid or no less afraid than we were back then. And just like adultery is, is warping, is warping the beauty of sex, murder is the warping of life, what God has given us, devaluing the most important part of us, life. We are a mago die, known and created and knit in the womb, and yet we destroy it. So some of you are saying, well, I don't struggle with that. Been a Christian for a long time. But then we get to Matthew 5, where Jesus says, Let me up with that a little bit. Matthew 5, verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Guilty. Church, guilty as of yesterday. Guilty as of probably this morning. Guilty as of every single day of my life. I have not gotten past murder. I've gotten worse. And I would like to think that probably we're all in that same boat. Murder is a disregard for the mind of God. It's looking at God's creation and saying, you're not worth it. Love does not disregard the mind of God. Let's go to the last one. You shall not steal. Then you guys steal, right? Zach, make sure we lock up some stuff. I don't want anybody stealing stuff today. That was a joke. I trust you guys. 
Everybody's tired because we all lost an hour of sleep. I understand. Stealing takes many forms, including this is a list from Ligonier, which I think they did a great job. Um, I think, do we have it on the screen? Awesome. So here's a list with some Bible verses. We'll leave it up for a second for you guys who want to write them down. I'm not going to read them. So stealing in scripture looks like this robbery, uh, kidnapping, human trafficking, receiving stolen goods, fraudulent business dealings, using false weights and measures, trespassing property boundaries, injustice in contracts, extortion, unethical loan arrangements, borrowing without returning, unjust lawsuits, and the funniest one I thought was plagiarism, which I plagiarized all of this from Ligonier, right, plagiarism. But this, all of these are, uh, are stealing, and we'll have these if you guys want to see where those are at. We can get that to you. I know that those are quick, and I was going to go into them. But you see that stealing is much more than going up to somebody and saying, give me your wallet. It's much more and in the same way we have allowed murder to happen and adultery to be glorified, we let stealing happen. And we don't think twice about it. And what is it? Well, it's the process of being unhappy with what God has given you. So you take advantage of another person to get what you deserve. That's mine, and I deserve it. And victimizing other image bearers of God because you are unhappy with the lot that God has given you. And it's the most basic form of not demonstrating love. I have a big sister. We would get bags of M&Ms. And I would count her M&Ms to make sure she had the same amount of M&Ms that I had. And if she didn't, guess what? I'm going to steal some of them M&Ms. Because everything has to be fair. Amen? How many M&M counters are out there? You guys are liars too. We're not even at that commandment. There's some M&M counters out here. I know it. It's from our basic forms. If you have kids, you see it too. Everything has to be fair. But church, here's the deal. Life was not meant to be fair. God's blessing for you is different than other people's. And the truth is, anything we have above death is a blessing. Amen. That's all we deserve. That's the only thing we deserve. Philippians. 4, 13, it says this, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Can I get an amen? amen? Well, let's go back and read 11. Let's see if we want to really amen this for a second. Verse 11 is this, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound in any circumstance. I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. We take this verse and we say, well, God's going to let me do whatever I want. I can do all things through him. When Paul is writing this from a Roman princess about to be put to death to a church that is getting persecuted daily, what does he say? He says, I can be content right here in this jail cell because I can do all things through him who strengthens me. God has put you where he wants you. Financially, physically, family-wise, be content and work hard. You might change your lot at some point. I don't know. You might improve it or decrease it. But whatever it is, you look to God and say, the glory be to him. Amen. So let's apply this a little bit. Tough point here. So if you're a non-Christian in this building, I want to tell you first and foremost, we look at these commandments and you might be saying, I feel guilty. I don't feel good. Here's the great part. There is forgiveness. There is forgiveness. Listen again, because I think we need to understand this. There is forgiveness. First Timothy, the saying, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Timothy, our Paul is writing to Timothy, Paul, the great evangelist, the great church starter, the one that's writing this book of Romans that has this theological argument that's just beautiful that tells us how to apply it, says this, that I am the foremost sinner. And he has received forgiveness. You may be saying that you don't deserve forgiveness, and you don't. You are correct. You may say, 
saying that you may be saying that Jesus can't forgive you. And you're wrong there. Because you are loved by Christ. He has died for you. He has provided salvation for you. And it just takes repentance and belief in him. Romans 1, 16, listen to this, how Paul starts this out. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Amen, church? Amen. I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it saves sinners. Let's apply this for Christians here, which I believe is the majority of us. There is forgiveness. Just like the each of these commandments have an alternative. And the alternative is obviously love here. Do not commit adultery. Find sexual freedom in your marriage. That's what it was designed for. That is the point. If you're single or struggling with same-sex attraction, which we can talk about what that is later on, then find your satisfaction in your relationship with Christ. Sex is not your be-all, end-all. And if you live a life where you have to be celibate, you can be celibate for Jesus Christ. It's not your identity. It's made for marriage between a man and a woman. Don't allow it to be the end all of your relationship. It does not define you. Rebecca McGoffin says this again, saying yes to Jesus is me saying no to sexual freedom. But it does not mean that you're missing out. At its best, marriage is meant to leave us wanting more. It's a gateway drug to a far more fulfilling relationship. It does not define you. Don't allow it to. For the do not murder part. Understand the precious nature of Imago Dei. That Jesus died for every person. The unborn that he knitted together. The living. The drug dealer. The homeless. The CEO. All carry the image of God. So do not hate. Watch what you say and what your heart says. Ephesians 4, 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Do not steal. This one's my favorite one because there is a clear uh, commandment after this. Do not steal. Instead, work hard and accept the blessing that God has given you. Be content in your blessings. And when the impulse comes up to steal, go to Ephesians 4 again, verse 28. It says this, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he have something to share with anyone in need. Isn't this great? Paul is writing to him saying, thief, stop stealing. Work hard and share with people. We stand against immorality, church, yes. We stand against immorality. We stand against immorality when we vote. We stand against immorality when we live. We call abortion what it is, murder. We call sexual sin what it is, sin coming in all different variants. Anything outside the confines of a, of a woman and a man being married and having sex is sexual sin, including porn use, all of that. We say what it is, it is sin. But we also understand that there are people on the other side of these arguments. And so while we stand up against sin, we understand that there's a mago die at the other end. And so we preach forgiveness and redemption to all people. We tell them who Jesus Christ is. Do not hate. Instead, be in love with the forgiveness that God gives to everyone who calls on his name. Because that is what we do in love. We do not deserve salvation. But the grace of God provides it. They do not deserve salvation, but the grace of God provides it for them. So while we push against immorality, we show the grace of God to the people at the under end of the conversation. We preach Christ crucified for our sins. We love them. We rejoice when someone who had an abortion is saved and get, receives forgiveness. We rejoice when the thief knows Jesus. We preach the same forgiveness that we have received. Amen. We made it to the hard point. Let's get to the second. There is a second one. And all of you are looking for your lunch reservation. Uh, Jane went long, not me, I promise. <laughs> the second part is this. That love is generous. Love is generous. We're defined by love, and love is generous. We're driven by love. I keep saying defined. Verse 8 says this. Oh, no one anything except to love each other. 
for the one who loves another has been fulfilled. Love is generous. So generous that no person ever thinks you owe them because your love has been so generous to them. Think about that. No person can come against you because you're just so filled with generosity that they can't look at you and say you're in debt. And this is not a financial verse. We're not talking about don't get a mortgage on your house. We're talking about being so overtly in love and generous with our love that people just look at us and go, what is going on here? Why are they so generous? There's nobody that looks at the church and asks, why aren't you serving that need? No one looks at his neighbor and asks, why are they going hungry? Instead, we instinctively, through our regeneration, seek to love the world through our generosity. Jonas Salk, there was another pandemic going on, and it was called polio. Jonas Salk came up with the vaccine at the time, and you see this now, even with the vaccine for COVID. That's big money. You make a vaccine, you patent it, you make your money. Jonas Salk came up with the, the polio vaccine, never patented it. Instead, he just sent it out for everybody to receive and eliminated polio on the face of the planet. When asked about it, he said this, there is no patent. Could you patent the sun? Giving generously is never self-serving. Giving generously overflows from a right heart. It means that adultery and murder and stealing company doesn't even come into your vernacular because you are so generous with your love. And our salvation should push us to generosity. It means nothing is sacred. Our bank accounts become utilities to serve people. Our time becomes a utility to serve people. Our church, the building, becomes a utility to serve people. Our church, the people, becomes a utility to serve people. This is who we are in our love. This is what the early church did in Acts 2. When Jesus ascends and then grows his church by thousands, what do they do? They live generously with each other. They demonstrate their salvation through generosity. The people were not saying, you owe me, give me back. Now they will, about Acts 6, they start doing that. But at least in the beginning they did. For the non-Christian, this is why the church exists. This is why we exist. Looking to show love through generosity in this world. For the Christian, this is our goal. Holiness is us loving generously. Not worried about sin because we're so focused on the love of Christ that sin is not the thing that comes to our minds. Just being more like Him is the thing that comes into our minds. So we wash it out. Let's end here. If I go to a lighthouse, my favorite lighthouse is not on earth. It is the moon. There it is. Yeah, that's a great picture of the moon, too. I love the moon. We are blessed enough in Napa to see great pictures of the moon. I was blessed growing up seeing some wonderful pictures of the moon, and it's great. But the moon, as though it can shine so brightly, has no eternal light source. Instead, the moon is only a reflection of the sun. So when you look at the moon, and it can be blinding, it is not shining its own light. It is only shining the light of the reflection from the sun. And in the same world, you do not have an eternal light source. But instead, we get to reflect the light of Christ to a very dark world. Church, this is our call, Ephesians 5. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Let's pray. Lord, we are thankful that we get to live Let our life be defined by love. Let our life be only focused on love. Let us repent of the sins that we may have committed. Whether it's through adultery and improper sexual relationships, whether it's murder and hatred, whether it's stealing, whatever it is, Lord, let us repent because we just want to love people more. We want to be more like you. Let us focus on loving our neighbor instead of our sinful urges. Let us have a self-sacrifice of faith. I thank you for this church, Lord. Let us be unified as we go forward, showing Napa love. And that brings tons of people to your saving grace. Be thank you. In your precious name. Amen. Let's
Houston.
buddy. How are you? Good. Did you guys go down south yesterday? Yeah. 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 Yeah.